<laughs> okay. We like to talk about films for your consumption. Come take a seat, I'll tell you something. If you like movies, we're the thing for you. You're watching Film Brew. Podcast. We're your hosts, I'm Brody Masinius. And I'm Jason Perez. And this is the fifth episode of the Film Brew Podcast. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back. I bet you guys haven't noticed... Our table is gone. <laughs> table is now gone. All right. And it's um, a different setting. Yeah, back from episode one. Back Unfortunately, episode David one. isn't joining us this time Sadly. anymore. Uh, but yeah, so we went from, what did we go from? We went no from table. no table to a, a small table to a large table, large table to an even larger table and back to no back table. Back to no table. But that's just how evolution works sometimes. Yeah. We said that by the fifth episode, we'd have our stuff together uh, for the Film Group podcast. Uh, in terms of, like, quality, maybe. <laughs> maybe not production quality as well, but at least in quality of just the podcast. This might be one of those episodes that we, we suggest listening to on Spotify other than YouTube. Maybe. But, but um, we don't know. We never know until yeah. after editing. I think... I mean, what difference does a table make besides we places to put our table, coffee? Though. We got and this small speaking table. speaking of places to put our coffee, Brody, we can't be called Film Brew without, without the brew. brew. Real quick, Brody, I want to show you guys a new feature we have on the show. Ready? You're not going to believe this. <laughs> that okay, that was one. the wrong sound. Look, you're not going to believe this. That was also the wrong one. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> Without the brew. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. We got our own button in the studio. Anyway, Brody, do me a big favor and explain the coffee for today. So today we're having a very different... It's February and we have two cups of ice. Why? Because... I was going to give some like pretentious spew about this, but the honesty is that we don't make money off of this. We're not sponsored by anyone. So sometimes we have to come up with different ideas to keep it fresh. Because we said we are going to do a different copy, coffee for every episode. We're going to do a different coffee. We're never going to repeat coffees. So when you run in this situation, sometimes you just got to have some fizzy cold brew. And the unfortunate reality is coffee is very expensive. Um, good coffee is very expensive. And, you know, sometimes, you know, funds are running low. And so we're going to grab a nice cold brew. Cold brew coffee, espresso roast from Chameleon. Where'd you buy that, Birdie? Dog. Target. Anyways, so I'm not a professional in this, you know. I explained it, I think, like two episodes ago that I... As much of a lover of coffee I am, I'm simply still in the learning process of making coffee. So yeah. fizzy cold brew isn't that hard, but I don't want to get it wrong, which I probably will. But I think it's half a cup or a cup of cold brew and a cup of sparkling water. Maybe half a cup, but we're going to do... We're going to... Okay, yeah. I don't know measurements. All right. We're Brody, test this out. give us a pour. I just want to make sure I'm not overdoing it. Thank you, it. my dear friend. And what are we going to, what kind of sparkling water are we going to add in this today? You guys already know our, our favorite fark, spark, our favorite fark. <laughs> you guys already know. Farley Brothers. Our favorite sparkling water, the regular on the show, the one, the only, Liquid Death. Please sponsor us. Please. We need you. Buried a lot this time. Last week we had the mango flavor. Today yeah. is a new flavor. What's with these new flavors, Liquid Death? They're coming out now. I think this is too much, but you got a mixing utensil? I don't, which is unfortunate. We get all right. I was gonna, I was gonna cut this out and get a uh, utensil and be back, but he's going right into it. It's really good. You know what? I have had sparkling cold brew before, but it's the gas station. Um, Starbucks one mixed with Perrier, uh, another uh, sparkling water company, which I do enjoy as well. But this is really nice. The ratio may be a little off, um, but you know, this will do. It's very. 
That's a really nice blend. It's like it not too, it's not too strong and it's not too light either. It's very. It is. Yeah, I feel like it brings out more of the, like the richness of coffee. And also gives it a sweetness too, because it is what is it? Definitely buried and alive. Buried, buried alive. Buried Definitely alive. some berry flavors in here. Anyways, you know we're called film brew, not just brew. So we got a film for this week, and that's of course the Watermelon Woman, as we said last week, directed by Cheryl Dunier. Yeah. So continuing on our our uh, you know Black History kind of binge, um, this is I think this is the most, and I think this is the most appropriate film for uh black history month as it's very much about black history in film fake black history but black history nonetheless yeah so Cheryl Donier, born may 13th 1966 in liberia she's a director and producer again most well known for the watermelon woman and the watermelon woman came out in like the around mid 90s i think mm-hmm. and it was uh although not as well known as other films it was really big, especially for the whole 90s queer cinema movement that yeah. happened, you know. And especially it was directed by a black lesbian. It was, you know, that was very rare during this time. And so it created a really, you know, for that audience, it was really important. And I'm glad it's getting a lot of recognition now because it's been, I believe it's been lost for some time until yes, it was picked up again by, it was a historian. I think it was something about cultural art or something. I should have read more into that, but it got picked up, and now Criterion has part of it. There's no Criterion release. It would be really cool if, for whatever reason, someone at Criterion is listening to this, put out Watermelon Woman on Criterion. I'll buy it. That'd be great. Um, I read somewhere that that upon the release of Watermelon Woman, it wasn't uh very well recognized in the united states that it didn't do very well I actually had a very small budget of about three hundred thousand dollars um which makes sense um but the three hundred thousand dollars given for the production of this film by actually the nea so the nea is the actually the national endowment for the arts uh so it's a grant basically given to this film and the interesting part that i wanted to inform you about birdie is that uh upon the release in the united states it got some controversy from a michigan republican i'm not sure i'm not going to pronounce this right but it's peter hoeskra so he actually cited this as an inappropriate use for government funds is what he claimed that this movie was and he said That's that it borderlines on the kind of like the line between film and pornography is what he claimed. And I guess I think he is alluding to a brief, probably like 20 second uh, kind of nude scene uh, later in the film. Yeah. And this really I think this is important because it really kind of proves the message that the film yeah. is trying to put out. That because Cheryl Dunier had has kind of like a fascination in real life for black history inside of filmmaking. And this fascination is because of black filmmakers. They have a really hard time of, of having their history kind of put into film for two reasons. One is lack of funding. And the other is kind of a lot of people will see it as taboo, especially back in the day. Thankfully, it's becoming more normal to see a lot of black filmmakers and that's why we're celebrating this but you know back in a different era we saw a lot of you know this was like the 90s, misrepresentation you know? yeah like 30 ish years ago but it's still you know we had a conversation about this in class a few days ago about censorship and this kind of goes into it you know because um a lot of the times you know you know if like in films about you know not just you know white you know relations within film but you know just straight relations in film and portrayed in this way doesn't get that big of a controversy you know it always will you know because yeah um sex and nudity in american in american culture is so different and we look at it so differently than other cultures around the world especially sex and nudity of women yeah it's it's very kind of frowned upon in american culture whereas kind of nudity of males isn't 
that uh, seen as taboo as when a female does it. That's that may be true, but what is shown more often in films? Yeah, definitely female. Maybe. Yeah. So it's such so it's such weird. It was like when there will be female nudity or because it, it will be shown in two different ways you know you see something like watermelon woman where it's obvious you know the the women on screen that are you know nude they're in power of their bodies in this situation yeah. you know they're you know it's there is a purpose towards it as in you could usually tell not always not not every man or male director does this but in times when you're watching like a film from the 80s even the 90s where there's a, either a sex scene or a, you know nudity in film you know you could sometimes yeah. get that creepy sense that oh this is filmed by a man but the unfortunate part is that nudity in films is kind of all seen the same way by a lot of people not by everyone but by a lot of people just like that um that what was it that that guy we talked about who he saw it as you know He's like, yeah, this is pornography, pretty much. Yeah, if you like, there's, it always makes me mad. It's such a big thing, like censorship and film overall, because it's always when people tell you what is and what isn't your own art, your own yeah. creation. You know, they'll say it's either, it's a movie or it's porn. You know, and sometimes people just say violence is porn. You know, too much violence goes into that category, or too much of anything goes in that category. Too much of anything that isn't, do you know, the standard American pride within film you know the standard gone with the wind stuff it's goes in the category x-rated or something you know well, uh reading more into that article it actually says that he tried unsuccessfully by the way he tried to get his colleagues in congress to deduct Donier's um budget by thirty one thousand dollars from that nea grant um basically saying that i mean he was basically uh, kind of objectifying that film sex scene and not really understanding the point because I mean that's the unfortunate thing most people will look at a sex scene and just think you know nothing deeply of it see sex as kind of like a like objectifying sex pretty much not seeing it as a way of an expression or an art form in filmmaking which I guess it would be a good place to kind of go deeper into the film I'll still talk about this because I think this is a good you know kind of topic to stay on with with this of course what going on with this um so, so basically the watermelon woman so after all that's been said yeah so watermelon woman it's okay so it's about a young african-american woman named cheryl denier uh lesbian working in philadelphia with her best friend tamara um she basically becomes consumed with this film project about a an african-american actress uh, performing in films in the 1930s going under the name of the watermelon woman i just went into my mouth and i didn't want to put it back into the cup <laughs> so i had to chew it real quick but yeah that's the watermelon one. this is very much a film that could have been made with little to it was obviously a very little budget but you know I, you see it happens you know you're not going to just put it back into the cup i think clerks had around uh, even lower budget, so I think even if they took the budget away, this film could have could have been made in one way or another. You know? Yeah, and um, it's a very low budget film, but to me, it was so surprising watching this film. It wasn't that surprising after you know thinking about it for a little more. But my first initial thought was like, why isn't this as talked about? You know, because like yeah. my first watch with this, you know, it's about this you know woman who works in a video store trying to make a documentary film. Like that's such a 90s film. Yeah. And the way it's kind of composed um, is a bit different too. Because, I mean, we have the opening shot where it's filmed as kind of like videographers uh, recording a wedding. I think I right? listened to an interview when she was talking about her, her first introduction with film was that her dad was a wedding videographer, I believe. So that was interesting. Yeah. And... I mean, I, I really like that opening because it reminded me of us and yeah. our videography work cool. that we do. And I don't know, it had a really like home movie kind of um, feeling to it. You know, we had the people working in the camera. And we, what we were seeing on screen was what they were recording of the wedding. And 
um, you know, you hear like their voices in the background, stuff like that. Kind of like the normal kind of mischief that comes with recording, you know, uh, a lot of so much things. happens. Under that. And it's always cool seeing that in like films now. I guess this film more than any other. But uh, when, you know, this about a film crew, you know, especially like a an amateur film crew filming a wedding, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. no, I do that right now, you know. And uh, it's cool because Sheldon Yame, you know, ended up making a film. and But this film is like really, it's a cool film. It has a very, like I said, a very 90s story. And so my first initial thought about that was like, why isn't that, why isn't this more known? Like, think about the 90s films, you know, the cheesy ones. You yeah. Know, like, Empire Records and stuff that, you know, everyone talks about. Jack Black films. Jack Black <laughs> films. High Fidelity, you know, stuff like that. It makes me think that why why wasn't this one? It's obvious, you know, though, why it's not as yeah. I mean, for reasons like that uh, Republican guy that we talked about, he's like, you know, he's probably not the only person with that take, unfortunately. Um, so, so, getting more into the Watermelon Woman. It's a very, it's entertaining. I think I I will get it out of the way now. I never like to, because I never like to talk down on the film no matter what it is. But like if it goes from like a cons and pros, I always like to start out with the cons because I just feel better about some of the pros, and it's just easier to get the you know bad things out of the way because I you know sometimes I need to be talked about. There's something I wanted to say that I didn't say during the film that I remember from the first time I watched it. And the first time I watched it, uh, and the second time being the day, I, I the editing is so I have yeah. a, I have appreciation for the editing now because we work. Whereas you know, as we said, we could relate a lot to her character in this film because we're in that stage of our we're not twenty five, but you know we're in that stage of production right now, and so a lot of the editing in that film yeah. I saw the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, this is bad, really mm-hmm. bad editing. Yeah, rewatching it again, I'm like. Ugh. I can't say anything about it. I, 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 I had that same uh, m- kind of thing going on in my mind as you did. Because I was watching and I'd see like maybe like a bad cut. Maybe where personally I wouldn't put it. Um, but then I started thinking, you know, those late nights I spent editing. And I'm like, you know, editing is hard. Especially when you're working with such a small budget. Working on a controversial piece of art that, you know, it's already a gamble making this thing. And... You know, I mean, editing isn't everything. Yeah. Uh, what it lacks in editing, it really makes up for in the passion that was put into this piece. Yeah. Kind of the um, ambition that we see in the characters, in the writing, and for sure in the directing. Now I have to wait for it to come out. What are you doing? I need to sneeze. But I want to, like, sneeze in the middle of it. I'm not cutting this out. Don't. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I had a sneeze. All right. So I'm sorry if I sound like a very congested and sick. I'm not sick. I have a cat. Put a picture of my cat here. It's a very precious little being. Thank little you, Lucy. Creature. Lucifer. But the thing is, I'm allergic to cats. And I slept with it before this podcast. Yeah. So it's very amateurish. And being a young person trying to get into film and has been working in small projects you know nothing i haven't even worked in something as big as the watermelon woman yeah, yeah sure. but you know working in small projects i found a new appreciation for amateurs films you know Cheryl denier's character is probably the realest part about this film yeah everything else is made up and she has this really good quote about it she said um i'm gonna paraphrase forgive me um but she said something along the lines of is that a lot of black lesbian history in film has been gone or it doesn't exist so i invented it you know sometimes you have to invent your own history she said something like that and that was really cool because knowing that watching this film how much she wrote into these fictional stories you know just to create some type of history for herself that you know otherwise has been either destroyed or erased or just doesn't exist at all you know that's really cool and even beyond that, I just think a lot of the writing is really snappy. It's really 90s writing, but it, yeah. I always enjoy 90s writing. It's entertaining me. I love the conversations. There are a lot of funny moments. It's a really film. funny film. Yeah. 
Um, and you know what, what you just said about kind of the lack of, you know, the availability of a lesbian in black history. Um, it really just comes from the lack of resources being given to, or at least back in the day, uh, the lack of resources given to the black community, to the lesbian community. And this really shows up, um, you know, to the document. Part. Yeah, the whole part of yeah. like, her just trying so hard to find information about this person. That's, you know, that, you know, a lot, although a lot of this film is made up, a lot of it is real. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, that makes sense. So Cheryl trying to become working on a filmmaker comes consumed with um, her project to do research on this uh, actress labeled Watermelon Woman. Um, Who we later find out his name is Faye Weathers. Weathers, something like that. Richards. Richards, yeah. Faye Richards. At, around the same time she learns the real name of this actress, she also learns that the actress is lesbian. And um, I remember she, in, in the film, she said something along the lines of, uh, me and Faye have now have two things in common, liking mm -hmm. women and liking film. She says something near the end of the film about when uh, she was talking to, I think was Faye's partner by the time of her death. Mm -hmm. and she was like, what Faye meant to you is different from Faye what it meant to me. Like, it means hope. And, and within that, that's really cool because like, because like one, like, you know, you could look at this from two ways. At least Cheryl did, you know, look, there's not a lot of history of black lesbians in film. You know, how am I going to make it in film if there's not? And he's so what did she do? She made a film about finding that history, you know? Yeah. That's what she did. And so representation within the film world, one, exists somewhere. You know, you just have to find it, you know? People always say representation matters and stuff like that. And like when a Coco came out, it was a big deal about it. Yeah. And but the thing is, like, uh, I guess it's a lot different, especially for a, a black cinema in this world. Um, because a lot of that is within America, you know, like with Mexican films, you know, Mexico's a country. It's got a whole country of culture and film, you know, a lot of black history gets ruined within American culture and you know, yeah. white culture. So it's harder. But so when it comes to representation, representation doesn't matter, but it exists. The fact that someone is queer in the film or the fact that someone is black in the film doesn't make them feel like they're not human if that makes sense it doesn't make them feel like they're a foreign object that they're that they're extremely like an outlier i think the camera stopped recording so the camera stopped recording so the camera stopped recording but that's fine if it if it does it again then we'll just fade to black have a photo of lucifer up while we speak i've seen a video podcasts do that sometimes it happens all right so if it dies again that's what we'll do anyway what was I saying? You know, this film didn't make it feel like um, the fact that Cheryl was black or lesbian. It didn't make it feel like they were a, a foreign, in a sense, to kind of their role in society within the film. And I think that's important because there are films who do that very you wrong. It's made by who it's representing. Mm -hmm. That's important because, like, one, it's very it's a personal film. There's a lot of talk about who they're trying to represent in this film. There's a lot of talk about them. That's what this film's about, you know? But they don't do it in a way to say... It, I guess the only way to put it is it's, it doesn't, it's not made by someone who isn't representing the film. Yeah. It's not made by someone outside of what the film is trying to represent. It, it's an insider's perspective, and that creates a lot of ambition because when you're someone who is a part of a misrepresented and underrepresented uh, community... Kind of taking on that initiative to represent, it's it's a big thing to do, and it takes a lot of courage, and it takes a lot of um, willpower to do that, and you know in this case, Cheryl Dunier did an amazing job. Um, I would love to see someone who you know falls into this category of maybe queer, uh, someone part of the black community. I, I'd I'd love to see that their um, their opinion on this film. Thank you, Bernie. Because we have been talked to by one of our viewers, we won't specify their name, about having someone who is part of... What did Mr. Sane say? <laughs> you said he wouldn't out them. Anyway. Listen, we want to know. If you're represented by these films we're talking about, let us know about it. Let us know if you want to be on an episode, you know. What's coming up? Women History Month. You know, we're going to do other stuff. If you're part of this 
group that we're trying to talk more about within film and you know about your, your cultures in film within film you know like if you're like Cheryl Lanier and you do research about it you know that's really cool to us talk to us about it of maybe course. you could be on a podcast you know? we'd love to have you on the podcast <laughs> it was it was side by side but when I poured it in to when I took it out of your hand right now what it was like up here that's fine I'm thirsty. I didn't. I should have opened another. This is gonna be liquid death now. We have Man. severed lime back here, but we'll try that outside of the camera. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, if you guys were really here, you guys would be able to see it. Yeah, but you guys are. You guys aren't here. Um. So yeah, I, I really do think it's important to have someone who falls into the category who is represented by these films to talk to us because I mean, let's face it, we're two brown kids. We have no idea what it's like to be a queer black person uh, in the 90s, I guess. And well, I don't think most people <laughs> listening to this would know what that would maybe, be in the 90s. Maybe if there's any 90s people out there. Hey, where the 90s kids at? King Andrew. Uh, one thing I want to just take a tangent off to uh, talk more about the uh, substance within the film. And uh, I always loved within films is, you know, I, it's so... It could be cliche at times, especially again during 90s films. So this film is a very 90s film. But something I love about them is that when a character works in a video store, you can look at Randy from Scream or even like High Fidelity, but that's the opposite. It's yeah. like a record store. Well, real quick, working in a video, a character working in a video store, a very kind of overused um, cliche yeah. in 90s films. But this one just does it differently. I you love know. all of that. <laughs> I just love when characters talk about films. I'm, I don't know. It's just always cool. Like that one scene where uh, where she meets scene. Diana and they're she's like, uh, it's a two for one special, and then she's like, well, I recommend this one. She's like, mm, no, uh, I, I, I recommend this one. Mm, no, I like that part. I like kind of like when me and you go to the record store. That's true. I wish video stores still existed. If anything, that no, out of everything this film teaches, all I learned was that I wish uh, video stores were still. That's all you learned from the watermelon. Learned. Learned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, yeah, but I I love video stores, and I love the fact that she implemented video stores in this film. You know, I'm not sure if she worked at a video store in real life, but even if she didn't, it's still just cool that she implemented it because it goes into the whole thing about like you know, passion for. If anything, if you plan on going in the film, uh, the film, what's that word called? Industry. Not industry, but, okay, yeah, film industry, but. Like line of work. Line of work. If you plan on going into the line of work of film, watch this film, no matter what, you know, color you are, no matter what your orientation is, watch this film. It's, you know, it's a great film, it's a great film on the idea of filmmaking and what a filmmaker has to go through to, uh, make a said film so yeah it's this, this is a film for so many different people yeah. yeah and i think that's something so cool about this film i think this this film is really important because it kind of represents how it feels to be consumed in something how to be passionate about something because in one way or another we're all passionate about something um even if you think you're not you probably are um we're passionate about podcasting and movies and coffee so it shows kind of like the links that someone would be able to go through for their passion so i mean look at the links that we go through for our movies this guy spent like what sixty dollars on eight and a half okay it wasn't six i bring this out <laughs> it cost me a lot of money but i bring this out because what you're explaining i think one of the best examples of it in this one right here eight and a half federico fellini's eight and a half um it's basically that same concept it goes to an extreme but yeah, I think the watermelon woman does that concept well within because it's such a well written film. Like even at the aspects, it isn't well made because again, it's a student film. But in the aspects where it counts, writing, it's a really well told story. It is, and, and I kind of love the dynamic of jumping from they're shooting and I think I haven't checked, but I think it's sixteen millimeter film, and it jumps between sixteen millimeter film and. Uh, digital vhs film um when it's shown in vhs film it's when cheryl's character is recording her little of uh, her project on 
black representation or black history in film. And when it is in 16 millimeter film, it is showing Cheryl's real life when she's working in the video store, uh, pursuing a romantic relationship, um, hanging out with friends, stuff like that. Mm. I think this is so weird to bring this up, but I'm just thinking about it. Hold on. I'll say this for the end. Edit this out. We'll save it for that. But yeah. A lot of what um, Cheryl Denier, there's so many different filmmaking techniques implemented, like again, when they're filming, you know, the documentary, when they're, when the actual film is being shot, you know, it's obviously shot in something different. In the films of Cheryl Denier talking to the camera, there's so many different elements in this film that all just kind of work together. It's, at times it could feel like a film, it's okay, it's a very messy film. But it's a film that knows what it wants to be. Mm-hmm. And that's always rare for a student film. You know, and in my opinion, at least the way I saw it, I could be wrong. You know, Cheryl Denier could come up here and say, no, you're wrong. But what I felt watching it was that with despite all the messes this film has, it is a film that knows what it's trying to do. I mean, if you even take a look at like Martin Scorsese's early work, um, even probably up to Mean Streets. Who's that knocking on my door is one of the messiest goddamn films I've seen in my life. I love you, Scorsese. That film, I hate that film. Yeah. Even up I'm to sorry. Mean Streets. I mean, Mean Streets, while I have an undying passion you for love Mean, mean Streets. streets I, love mean, I streets, love mean Streets. But I will not deny that Mean Streets can get very messy. Because it doesn't know. And see, that's another reason why I love Watermelon Woman. Because I gave it so much respect. Mean Streets, I think it's like around the sixth feature film. Or the fourth or sixth around there. I could, Scorsese's made so many films. He's made many. But like around that time in his career, at that point, Scorsese even had trouble trying to, you know, this could of course be the writer's fault as well, but Scorsese as a director also has a job of trying to make sense of it. And um, I love Mean Streets. I, you know, it's a film I've seen. I've seen that film countless times at this point. I've seen it so many times. I love Mean Streets. When I make my first feature film, I'm going to watch Mean Streets and learn from it. But it's a film that has no idea what it wants to be. It was an extremely entertaining film overall. It's really entertaining. Uh, sometimes when I watch a film that I deem not very well done, I have a hard time watching it. And I often am like, when is it going to be over? You know. But on a film like this, I was just fully entranced. Uh, the characters, the events on screen, the unique filming style, and the writing overall. The characters, they're not like... They're not like Wes Anderson characters or like, um, what's another filmmaker that writes characters? They're not like, they're not like... Char- Paul Thomas Anderson yeah, they're characters. Not Paul Thomas Anderson characters, you know. But they're characters that... I remember them. They're memorable characters. They they're feel not, like real life people. Yeah, they're like, not in like a Sean Baker sense or like a Paul Thomas Anderson sense, but in the sense that... Alright, I, I can watch this, dude. You know, I can yeah. watch this... I watch these characters for, you know, an hour and a half, you know, because sometimes when, you know, you watch films, again, especially 90s films, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, get that intro scene where you meet all the characters and whatnot, all these cliches happen, and you're just like, yeah, this film is like 90 minutes, but I, you know, 90 minutes seems like a long time when I have to watch these characters. I don't feel that with this one, you know, again, they're not so great written characters but they're like they're characters i could watch they're you know fun to watch i thought diana's character was really interesting uh diana was a love interest of cheryl nanier's in the film um it was kind of like a mirror of faye richards and martha um yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what was it, Martha? Martha Page. Martha Page, uh, who's again, I believe, is fictional as well. Um, at least when I was looking into it, I think it's fictional, because uh, the plantation memories was actually, you know, it was recorded for the film. You know, mm. uh, it was written by Cheryl Denier and it was it was directed by someone else, but I just know it was filmed for that film specifically, so it doesn't exist. Um, but um, what was I thinking? It doesn't exist. Um, yeah, so it's obvious that uh, it's so cool when that happens, you know. And it's a little cliche writing aspect. You know, when you start learning writing, it's a little cliche because a, a character is learning about something and then ends up living through that life. With the watermelon woman, it kind of works on a level because you see, you know, Faye, you know, the watermelon woman get bashed through history for 
you know, like censored to a point with her relationship with Martha from two sides. You see Martha's sister, I believe. Yeah. And she's like, no, she wasn't lesbian. She wasn't like that. Then you see Faye's, Faye's partner during her death. Her first partner. Her. Well, before she yeah. died. And she was like, why are you going to tell a story and have her in it? You don't need no white woman in it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you can see that with Cheryl. Because her friend, Teresa, was her name? What? Tamara. Tamara. All right. We see it a lot with, uh, with uh, so her relationship with Diana and her friend, Tiara. Tiara? Tamara. Tamara. Forgive me. Tamara. Um, how she's like, oh, but when she dates a white woman, it's, it's obvious she's not happy about that relationship, you know? Yeah. And so you see Cheryl Denier's character really find herself within uh, Faye, we- Faye Richards. There's so many people this film is made for, you know? There's so many people that get so much out of this film. And it's really, I could just, I have a, I have a big high respect for this film. With that being said, that was the watermelon one. Thanks to everyone for watching. What a great, what a great film. What a great film. All right, what a great overall. audience. What a great audience. Thank you, audience. Um, Thank I want to start doing this thing by the end of our podcast. We're just kind of talking about some news. You know, it's related to film and kind of like our wheelhouse of ideas mm. and things that are just brewing, brewing. in our mind. Brewing. Wait. <laughs> Out the brew. So I guess before we <laughs> I guess before we get more into it, we we'll do a moment of silence for Monica Vitti, who recently passed away from a battle with Alzheimer's at age ninety. If you saw our, I think it was our third episode of Master None, we talked yeah. a lot about Italian cinema. We talked a lot about Monica Vitti, a so, great actress. Uh, Monica Vitti's death is kind of a. I mean, it hit really close to home, especially because we just binged through like yeah. Three films. And, you know, watching all these films, it was because Monica Vitti played such a predominant role in a lot of these Italian films, uh, Italian films that influenced us a lot in our kind of way of writing and the way we look at films. So seeing this predominant person um, kind of in our film watching and filmmaking lives uh, leave us, you know, hits, hits pretty close to home. And... Uh, you know, we just want to say that we have a really, really high appreciation for Monica Vitti and her performances in all these great films. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I don't have any more coffee. But Thank you for the time you had when you, in the words of Criterion Col- Channel, Criterion Collection, bless the screen. Thank you. All right. So now that's, we got that talked about. How was your week? My week was interesting, actually, because I got a lot done, but it was to the point where I did not feel stressed out about it, right? Um, This week, I went to a wolf sanctuary, which I'm making a video about. I worked on a Black History Month project about Angela Davis, which was a pain to export out of Adobe after effects uh interesting week dude um mr sane shout out to mr sane because just because our man, our man mr sane um i guess we could call him our sponsor our sponsor he's right? the one who keeps us alive for now yeah he doesn't give us so. money but he platforms he us platform. um we want to say thank you to the yonker the discussion news page for having our podcast featured on it and um if you made it this far into the podcast i blow a kiss to you <laughs> yeah my week was a little it was kind of boring <laughs> i did a lot of work i did a lot of writing um something for the for the people listening i saw parallel mothers recently uh pedro amadovar film his newest film i wrote a review on it, it watch it look at that there. read it um i'll put it in the description actually the description. when it gets when it put out, out like yeah. two weeks or something um but yeah, so I saw that film in theaters. I love the theaters. I love going to theaters. Yeah, We're going to be nice. going to theaters more often. We should do like a vlog type of thing where we go to the theaters. We just bring our camera into the theaters. Into the theaters. And we watch them. I think that's illegal. <laughs> I think illegal. that's illegal. Not illegal. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, for, you know, I guess we'll give a little schedule thing. We're not giving the whole schedule away. We'll give next week's uh, 
title out? Look out for Wayne's right World. Okay, so yeah, so we're going a few months ahead. <laughs> you, no, you already talked about it last podcast. Oh, you, yeah. You slipped up on it. Wayne's World, we're going to be going to the theater, watching Wayne's World in theaters. We're going to do a podcast on that. The Batman's coming out. We're going to check that on theaters, do a podcast on that. And, you know, we're going to be trying to do more recent releases within film. Those might be separate from, like, we record, we have a schedule now, as I brought up last time. Every Friday, we're going to record it. And we'll get it out around every Tuesday or Monday. When on the channel, the it'll be out earliest. So if you're a diehard viewer, you're going to get it first on the YouTube channel. Yeah. And then if it's you're always watching... like a few days after we record it. It's so like Sunday, Monday. Yeah. yeah. If you're watching from the Yonker news page, then it'll probably come out probably the day after we put it yeah. on the YouTube channel. You know, we thank you for my watching. Thank you for watching. Next week. Next week. Next week. So yeah, we have a schedule. Those other films, they might come out possibly during different times. The schedule is only at wonky, but for now, we have a pretty solid schedule. So be expecting more podcasts. We're not going to leave you in the blue. Next week, we'll be looking at Spike Lee's Bamboozled. And Bamboozled. It's a very hard to find film. So I'm going to tell you something. I have it here on Criterion. Wait, um, wait, wait. We're going to be watching this next week. I believe it's on YouTube. I don't know if you can find it anywhere else. If you can, do watch it because it gets taken off of platforms easily. Not because of the film itself, but because it's just a very hard to find film. It was recorded digitally with handheld cameras, which you're going to, I don't know if you're going to like or not. Um, I'm fine with digital, okay? Yeah. But it's <laughs> handheld, like digital okay. handheld cameras. I mean, that's what we do. That's true. So anyways, that's going to be next week's film. Watch it. Join us next week. We're going to try to get more guests on the podcast. Watch the Watermelon Woman. Watch the Watermelon Woman. Uh, that's next week. You have it. Thank you guys this has been this so week's. much. Episode 5. This has been Episode 5 of The Film Brew. We like to talk about films for your consumption. Come take a seat, I'll tell you something. If you like movies, we're the thing for you. You're watching Film Brew. Podcast. This was really good. I enjoyed this. We went through two cans, and I was gonna say, Give me the rest. Feed it to me while I'm playing the guitar. Give me your nectar, Birdie. Don't say that. Okay, you're taking this. <laughs> you're taking this. This is yours now. I'm waiting for it. Watch Sledgehammer. <laughs> take this. You take this. I wonder if they cut out. <laughs>